Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Growth Driven Agency Podcast, where I have the privilege of sitting down and deconstructing agency owners who have built incredible and thriving agencies. And today's guest is no different. My name is Joe Gilkey, your host, as well as the CEO of Sales Driven Agency, where we create predictable and scalable growth for agencies by building out the entire sales operation for them in 90 days. If you are here and you are listening to the Growth Driven Agency Podcast, first of all, thank you. Uh, but secondly, you're not just here to think about growth, you're here to be driven by it. Uh, and today you're in for a treat as me and my guests are going to dive into how we view growth, um, how we are achieving it for our agencies, and more importantly, how you can do that for yours as well. And without further ado, Jacques, thanks, man, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to be deconstructed, as you said in that intro. <laughs> well, good, man. well um, just for the listeners to give them a little bit of a background on you, uh, obviously, you live in sunny San Diego, if I recall. I actually used to live there myself uh, before getting back here to Knoxville. Tell them a little bit about you. Tell them about Raindrop, and then we'll kind of dive a little bit into your story. Yeah, Raindrop's been a really incredible journey. Um, I, uh, I turned 35 this weekend, and it, uh, we are also celebrating our 11-year anniversary um, of starting Raindrop in a, in a couple of weeks. And so it's just been a really incredible journey. When you talk about growth, you talk about agency growth. I've never set out to necessarily start an agency, um, but that's certainly what it's evolved into. And it's been so much fun. Uh, we have about 50 team members currently. Um, and we have really carved out a name for ourselves nationally in creating direct consumer advertising that breaks through the noise. We had the number one top performing ad of the entire year this year on YouTube. Uh, they published that um, this year. And um, I, I was just loving that stat because obviously it's fun, but I also feel like this was such a unique year for direct to consumer brands with everyone being home, hitting all sorts of records. So I like to joke that we have the best performing ad of all of human history, Absolutely. considering the, uh, the boiling, the, uh, the kind of pressure cooker that this year has been for online sales. But um, it's been a, a ton of fun. And um, yeah, we're, we're a full service agency, meaning. You know, um, anyone that is really a, a brand forward brand, a direct consumer or business to consumer brand, mm -hmm. we are fully outfitted to support them. Uh, we do, we've developed and designed over 200 websites, for instance, over the last decade, um, all custom, um, all incredibly talented team members. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, yeah, this man. And I, um, and we're going to dive into that ad here in, in a little bit because uh, yeah. what's funny is before I, Got introduced to you and knew you. Um, I've actually shown a bunch of people that ad. So it's one of those viral ads. And when we start talking about it, I'm sure a lot of you will actually know the ad itself. But we'll keep it a surprise for a minute until we jump in. But I want to go a little bit back further. So before Raindrop, before you got into marketing, like you said, you got into it accidentally. Yeah. Or at least it wasn't intentional, which is 80% of agency owners that I know kind of found themselves running an agency one day. Like, oh, I didn't set out to do this, but it kind of happened. <laughs> Totally. Um, but I want to go further back than that. I kind of want to go back to like 12 year old Jock. Like, oh my gosh. Like, 12 year old Jock, what were you like? What were you into? Yeah. What were you interested in? What do you think you were going to be if it was an agency owner? Obviously, what, you know, who were you at 12 years old? This is actually something I've never shared with anyone, but I had a really life changing moment mm, probably about. Uh, a year ago, what happened was I was digging through my my mom kept a lot of stuff, like every report card I ever had, every every standardized test, every whatever. I like and so, and so I was I was helping her clean it out, and I was digging through, and I found a uh, standardized test report that basically said that in science and in math I was in the top ninety six percentile, hmm. but in English communication and writing, I was in like the 36th or 40th percentile. Okay. And I feel like in this day and age, like people would have been like, Oh, you're going to be an engineer and you're, or you're going to be a scientist or something. And they would have like forced me in that direction. Somehow my life did not develop in that way. And I, I'm now truly, I would say I'm a storyteller. That's, that's what I do best. And I, I'm a problem solver. And that's how I became, I feel like an agency owner is I just have always enjoyed problem solving and telling stories. Um, and really in college, what, what happened was I ended up doing an on-campus show where it was essentially a prank show. Like we would just show up and film ourselves. And it was just weird stuff. Like 
seeing what people would do for a Klondike bar, like, or <laughs> we, would, we would protest the handing out of flyers on our main student walk by handing out flyers to protest that. It was just like weird stuff. But now I'm on YouTube, I'm on TikTok, and I'm like, that's literally the top performing content is these just weird What's pranks. The big bucks, uh, right? I just always thought in that, in those ways, I guess. It's just like, it's, it's just what it is, uh, something that is not work to me. I'm passionate about it. I just enjoy it. I spend a ton of time consuming internet video. Um, I mean, I was texting with someone this morning and I was like, don't get on TikTok. Like TikTok is basically meh. If Instagram is marijuana, like it's a hard drug, like don't do it unless you're ready. Cause it'll suck you in. <laughs> what's your, what's your opinion on, on, uh, Instagram rolling out reels? You know, I think in general, um, I, I look at myself and I haven't spent any time looking at reels on Instagram, but I spend at least six to eight hours a week on TikTok consuming content. So uh, to me, I'm like, it's, it's always been about community, right? Like once you start, um, even if you're just a passive viewer, it's like you start seeing the same people, it's like anything. And so, you know, if you're, it's like reels, it, reels to me is like what Facebook tried to do when they did like, Facebook live stories like Instagram has has the stories. It's like you can copy features, but they don't always stick. And right. so I, I don't. I mean, I'm I'm bullish on where TikTok's headed for sure. Love it. Cool. Well, we're still kind of in the early stages. So you you found yourself on accident with Raindrop. Um, yep. What was kind of the move? I mean, did you have a career prior to Raindrop? I know you said that yeah. around your eleventh yeah. eleventh year anniversary, right? Yeah. So out of college, I was really fortunate. I got a job at NBC. Okay. Um, I should have never gotten that job. <laughs> uh, meaning they, they, this is another story I've never told. Uh, when I was taking the writing test for the news uh, organization, they forgot that I was in the room. And so they gave, they were, I was supposed to have an hour and 15 minutes and I ended up with two hours and 15 minutes because I like just, I was a slow reader at the time and I just, I took forever. I would have like failed the test, but they forgot I was in the room. And then I like popped my head out and I was like, Hey guys, like, is anyone going to come get me? And they were like, Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> they just thought I sat there in the, in the room. And I was like, I needed every last minute. Uh, so I got that job and it was, it went really well. It was a lot of fun, but I realized my future's not in news. Um, and I had a, just a, it was a, a guy named Ray Wetterland. who's a personal trainer. And he's like, I need someone to make videos. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I can shoot videos on the side. And, um, you know, he was really the first, like, there wasn't such thing, uh, such thing as an influencer 10 years ago, but he was a, he was an influencer. And, um, and so I helped him blow his brand up and one thing led to the next, I'm getting referrals. And I'm like, so I started with, you know, personal trainers and nutritionists and lawyers and law firms, just like helping, like, you know, I can do this. I'm 24 years old, just helping, you know? And what did you charge in that first deal? Just curious. Oh, I mean, uh, I was charging about twenty hour, twenty dollars an hour for my time, uh, and uh, and I remember how life changing it was when someone explained like you can actually charge like fifty bucks or sixty bucks, right? Because like no one had ever paid me more than fifteen or sixteen dollars to do anything. So I was like, oh, like I didn't know people say yes to that. Um, so it's you know pricing is an interesting journey, and I'm sure that's a big part of what you help people with as well. Mm-hmm their journeys as agency. Yeah, yeah. The value, exactly. value-based pricing and, and really pricing based off the value you bring, not so much the hours you put in. And uh, Exactly. But I always find it funny when we talk about agencies, what they used to charge their first days and you know, myself, no different, right? The first thing I ever did on my own, I think I charged, I think I charged like 300 bucks to build a website. I, didn't, I couldn't really build websites at the time. So I had to learn. So I, I had spent, I don't know, 50 hours and made 300 bucks. But it was, yeah. it was it was the proudest three hundred bucks I've ever made, right? At the time, which is hilarious. Um, but that's just you're getting, you're getting you're getting paid to learn, right? Exactly, right. I got paid to learn. I, I might have actually paid them to learn at that point. How many hours I spent on it? But hey, uh, not as much as I spent on college. Well, that's not true. I went to college for football, but for free. But the amount of time I spent. So you ended up finding yourself. You started. You did this video. His name was Ray, right? Right. Yeah. RW3. Yeah. And, um, and then you got in, you started doing stuff with lawyers and different things. And then yep. obviously, you guys have gotten more to direct consumer. Talk a little bit more about that trajectory for, for Raindrop. And, and I do want to get into people too, because I actually know someone on your staff who is literally their entire job is to take care of your culture and your people, Danny Kim. Danny Kim? I know Danny Kim. 
You know, Dr. Danny. Oh my God. Man, the industrial psychologist himself. What an amazing man he is. He's a human. He's, he's, a, just he's a incredible human. Long story yeah. short, um, my wife uh, was in full-time campus ministry at San Diego State and was a part of a church at the time in, in off El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego called Harbor Church. And Danny was like a campus pastor at the time. And so we got to know him and, and a worship pastor too. Yeah. So we actually get to know him through that. And then I've just, we've kept in touch over the years. And I, I saw that he started with you guys. Um, this is before I think I knew about Dr. Squatch and the stuff we'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, yeah. yeah, you care a lot about people. Yeah, I think uh, there's been a couple interesting, important inflection points in our our journey, as with any you know company over a ten year period. Um, and through it all, though, the through line has been our incredible team members. I mean, we've we've had at least ninety percent plus retention every year for the last decade, wow. um, and so our team has really grown like in ways that. I didn't even know, honestly, that people could professionally. Like, I think about even where we were a year ago before COVID and just how people have been pushed this year, you know, beyond what what would typically happen and watching them grow. It's just like, it's hard not to be proud, but you can't get there without a little bit of pain, unfortunately. And this year has been hard. It's been a, it's been a, a topsy turvy sort of uh, experience. And so, you know, our first real sort of breakout moment was we did a project with the San Diego Symphony. And this is all related to me in my mind, but we did a project with the San Diego Symphony. It was a grant project. It was super successful. And after we were done, I said, Hey, you know, here's some ideas that you guys could do for your marketing. I think, I think you could reach a much broader audience than you are right now. Mm -hmm. And the, at the time, the, the VP of marketing there, Steve Baker, turned around and was like, let's do that together. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I was just like trying to give you suggestions. I didn't mean us. We had like four or five employees at the time. Okay. And so, um, and I didn't know anything about classical music. Um, and that's, that's been really interesting because I always have people say, well, you, you know, do you have any experience in this? And so the answer with classical music was like, no, like, you know, classical music. I know people, I know how to help you build this. And so over a six year period, we helped the San Diego Symphony double their ticket sales, which is insane. Like a hundred percent increase. They said these increases and decreases by like three to five percent. So to have those massive increases was really interesting. I think it what it did for me was it gave me the confidence to say, let's think about every client, every industry, just through a fresh lens. Right. And um, so then fast forward to about three years ago, we got introduced to Jack Haldrip and he was uh, with Squatch. And um, he was five years into his business and he asked me point blank, he said, have you ever worked with direct consumer brands? And I said, you know, not really Jack, but like, we're like, we're just different. Like we think different. I think we could be really successful for you. And I, I remember it like, I remember where I was sitting. I remember that conversation. I remember when he took the chance on us because he did. It was like, I was like, Hey man, you're selling seven dollar bars of soap. You're not selling soap. Like soap is it's you can get a thirty pack from Costco for ten bucks. So like we're selling something totally different. We need to create. We need to create a brand where men just feel something different when they when they smell the product, when they open the product, when they use the product. We have to create something that really is fun and sticks. And um, and he took that chance on us and. Uh, they're they're quiet about their their numbers, but he, he they have grown by more than thirty times the 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 monthly revenue than when we started with wow. them, um, and it's been it's been an incredible journey. Um, and they were they were really our first true breakout direct consumer client, but we've definitely had a couple since that have scaled by tens of millions of dollars. In a year. I still yeah, like, the other day I literally showed someone. Yeah, uh, so they're they're fine. Totally unrelated to to this conversation was just. This is what I think direct to consumer has to look like today. Um, but one thing that you said that was really important, and I think this is so when when I hire salespeople, right? I I specialize in the hiring, training, and managing of salespeople for agencies. And something that you said really stuck out, which was a lot of agency owners have a difficult time bringing a salesperson into a more consultative sale, right? Because no one can can sell it as good as you can, and no one is a strategically thinking, and no one knows your product better than you do, which is all true. Uh, but something that you said that when you were even selling into industries in which you've never sold into, which is somewhat 
you know, similar to a salesperson selling a product they've never sold is a, 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 a quote that I like is in the land of the blind, the one eyed man still rules. Right. <laughs> and so, and I think what, what's, what's cool about that is that, yes, you didn't know classical, um, but you knew people and you knew psychology, you knew, you knew video. And so, um, and same thing with Dr. Squatch, which was, had you done direct to consumer? No. Um, but he also had never had success having a massive YouTube video go viral and have hundreds of millions of views. Right. Right. And so in the land of the blind, right. In this case, he was in the land of the blind when it comes to video, the one eyed man, you rules. And so I think it's the same thing when it comes to, to bring on salespeople, that, that same mentality of helping that salesperson have confidence, knowing that they are the expert on that call on that particular subject, whether they've been there for a couple of months or a couple of years. I think that's super important to, to take into that conversation. Yeah, I, uh, it's been interesting because we are just now, for the first time in our, in our company history, hiring a salesperson. We've never had one. We never had a sales team, we never had a salesperson. Uh, we are now, for the first time in that process, um, and a lot of that just has to do with the amount of inbound interest we've received this year, mm-hmm. which is which is really great. Like it's just it's it's a little bit inundated, right? Like sure. uh, dealing with you know 15, 20 inbound inquiries, and then figuring out which ones are the best fits for us. And um, and we because ultimately, what I found is like I'm sure there's a lot of agencies out there that will say yes and take your money. Like mm-hmm. I'm sure that like 80, 90 percent of agencies are just like, oh my gosh, you want to give us money and work with us? Of course. I, I just I feel like. I always think through the lens of like, can we be truly successful with this client? Yes. Most importantly, not just for the client, but for our team members, because it's really deflating to work on something that doesn't work out or doesn't see success. And so, as much as we can, we want to see success for everyone involved. Our, you know, you know, people are people in the sense of like, you're going to feel a lot of joy when you're doing something that people are excited about, that's selling, that people are responding to. And so we, we pass on probably 90% of inquiries because of that. It's, it's uh, getting laser yeah. focused. On these. And on top of that, when you do that, the value that you can bring to this clients you do take on enables you to charge way more. Right. We talked about value-based pricing. Like I would imagine you're not charging hourly necessarily anymore today. You're probably charging on the value that you bring or even potentially, I don't know if you do this or not, and we can talk about it, but a rev share model with your clients, um, you know, performance based on top of paying for the value that you bring. But I, I think that it's it's super important that as you get laser focused on who you serve, like right, I, I only serve agencies, period. Mm-hmm. Um, I get inquiries all the time outside of that. And even within agencies, I have very specific criteria for who we work with because I want to be successful in how I help them be successful. And if I don't feel like we can perform to a certain level with that agency, then I'm just going to, I'm going to pass on it and point them in another direction or just flat out tell them I can't help them. Yeah. Huge. How did you, how did you get to that level where you had that confidence to, like you said, 80, 90% of agencies take on anything and everything. Kind of like you, if it has a, if it moves and it can pay you, they'll say yes. Yeah. How to make um, that decision of like, we, we want to be. We want to have a conviction about who we work with. I think, in general, if I were to sum up the way that myself and my business partner Adam feels, it's like I, everything I do with the business is rooted in the thought of like we are doing life together. Um, and I just it is. I know it sounds. It's like I'm not in it. Like they're not in it for the money. I'm not in it for. Like I'm like money will come with the success of the of the agency, and when things don't go well, like you don't make money. Like that's the reality of the of the yin and yang of that. But I think maybe just having started it so young, having it already exceed any of my wildest expectations, my goal is really to provide for our team not just financially, which is part of growing any business. You know, I like growing things, and so that's why we're bringing on a salesperson and and. I think hopefully eventually crafting a little bit more of the direction we're heading rather than just receiving the inbound stuff. Um, but then also, you know, hiring Dr. Danny Kim was a huge investment in our team because, you know, he's not a traditional HR person. He is world class in who he is, what he does, and helping to really lay out like, like better training, um, training that goes beyond just 
your job responsibilities, but just becoming a better person um, and charting like career paths. And then, then our job is to continue to grow it to provide those. I mean, I recognize that a big part of our attention is that we grow every year. Mm-hmm. And if we don't grow every year, like people are getting stagnated, especially if they're wired in the way that they want to grow. Um, and so um, I love that we have someone in Danny that, you know, they only have one client and that's our people. You know, there's nothing pulling at his attention externally. He doesn't interact with our clients. His only client is our people. And um, so that's, you know, I know that this investment now will pay the next decade will be the, the dividends of, of bringing someone like him in is just enormous. Um, so, yeah. I think that's so cool. I think and it's super unique. I, I don't I actually don't I can't think of an agency who's hired that role. I mean, plenty of hired HR, right? And they're right. Charged- Hiring and, and all that stuff, but I think for you, bringing someone like Danny, and obviously I know Danny, it, the level of caliber that Danny brings to the table in terms of just people management, people uh, cultivation, I think it's huge. Uh, you mentioned retention. Um, I talk a lot about profitability comes with retention, both in retaining clients, but then also retaining employees. Like it is, right. employees are very expensive, and if you lose an employee that you invest a lot of direct money in or indirect money, you know, through time and and that kind of stuff, it is a very large hit to the bottom line of the agency and the health of the agency. And again, it's not always about money, right? It's about people. But I think it's important to think that if if we're looking to build healthy, thriving agencies, which is the goal of this, focusing on retention is almost more important than acquisition, which is funny considering I'm a sales guy and and most people talk about acquisition with me. It's like, I, I would actually start with retention first then you become more profitable the more you retain yeah. clients and people. No, I love that advice. I, my analogy for it is sometimes people get so busy picking the lemons that they forget to make lemonade. Um, you know, it's like, they're always like, what's the next thing? And it's like, but what about all the people and the things you have now? And right. you know, how are, how are you uh, taking care of, of those people? And again, it's like, I, I, I recognize as a leader, like I'm just doing my best, like mm-hmm. uh, in the sense of, you know, I started this when I was 24. I never worked for some big corporation. I mean, I worked for NBC, a big corporation. But in terms of just like, you know, I'd never managed anyone before. And now I'm like partially responsible for at least 50 people. So, um, you know, I think... And everything. Totally, totally, totally. And so, you know, I just look at it as, um, you know, uh, I don't... It's funny. I don't. I guess I just don't see the business through... Like it's, I've had to backfill in things like mm-hmm. profitability mm-hmm. and everything else, you know. And our team has grown around, you know, because uh, at, one, at one point it was just me, and now we have a director of finance and a director of people and culture and people who can do the things. And obviously, my my business partner Adam is really just like our backgrounds here, very much the yin to my yang. Um, <laughs> uh, he is uh, he is truly um, a strategic genius, and and he's been a big part of driving us forward and, and getting the business component of it really running along with the creative thoughts and the creative abilities that we have. I love that. That's huge, man. Well, I'll dive a little bit into the tactics now. So um, obviously we could talk now more about, we've already alluded to it a couple times. So you guys basically storming onto the scene with Dr. Squatch, that was a massive success. I mean, would you argue that's the most successful campaign that you guys have run? Uh, it's, uh, it is dollars, but in terms of impact, no, it, it, it all around it is a yes and a yes. I mean, it's the, I think it's the most viewed full campaign in internet history. If you consider, you know, we did a hundred million plus views on the, I think we did like 150 million views on the first video. The one this year, which was like a matchup video, did like 120 million. Um, and then you have all the other, I mean, we probably, uh, once you add them all up, um, maybe Purple Mattress has a competing campaign totally, but like it's it is just on a whole nother level for them. There's just it's lines real- in there that stick in my the uh, mommy's little boy. <laughs> like that's oh, yeah. in my head. <laughs> oh, little man. Totally. Mommy's no, little, I- yeah. If you haven't seen the the Dr. Squatch commercial, you please go to YouTube and look it up. It's the one that has a hundred plus million views on it, so you can't miss it. Well, there's two now. So the other one is uh is a mashup. It's like a five minute mashup of all the ads we did for them over the last two or three years. And that, that one's actually the best performing ad really? in their history. Yeah. So it's like, a, it has like clips from all their different ads. And then 
like random, like just people smelling it on the street and reacting to it. It's, it's really, to me, stepping back, like if I were a marketer, that's the ad that I'd actually study, not the original ad. The original ad was great, but it took like two years to scale to that kind of view versus, and it, you know, versus this one this year, which it scaled to a hundred million views in like two and a half months. So, and it, and it was a hundred percent based on the fact that it was selling, like, you know, it wasn't just, uh, maybe it wasn't as shareable, but sure. by the time you're done watching it, people buy. And that's the goal of advertising. That's the goal, right? Especially direct consumer. Yeah. So you talk about, you guys have a lot of inbound leads, a lot of in- inbound inquiries. You only work with 10, 15% of them. How have you guys leveraged your work? How are you guys currently driving inbound? Is it just through word of mouth and referrals just from knowing that you guys work with Dr. Squatch and a couple of these other brands? Yeah. I mean, um, I would say 50% of people find us through Googling ads that they've seen for like works power tools. Uh, Cause we do a ton of work for works um, and they're having a great year. Um, Amigo uh, is another brand that we do a ton of work for and they've had an amazing year. Um, and then uh, and Dr. Squatch, of course, I would say a lot of inquiries come in through those three um, channels. And then we do our own social advertising as well. And that also drives um, a lot of interest. I think a lot of people see these ads and they just don't know who's necessarily behind them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a process for us of like just getting our bearings. Um, we have some really exciting projects coming out next year with some really big brands and it'll be, it'll be really fun. A lot of people are looking to us to break through on YouTube because you know, YouTube is, is like the greenest pastures if you know how to tackle it. Mm. Uh, but it's really hard to do. You can't just, you can't throw up a pretty photo and scale it. It doesn't work. And it does work on other platforms. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're right now. So I've, my whole background has been high ticket selling and we've been largely outbound, um, you know, targeting ideal clients that way. And we've just now gotten to the world of, all right, well, let's start driving more traffic through, through different ad channels. And you're right. YouTube is green pastures. It's also much different than the success we're having on Facebook would not be successful on, on YouTube. Right. And yeah. so it's a different it's yeah. Who are who are some of the not specifically the accounts, but what are certain brands that you do look to work with in that ten percent of brands that you would normally, you know, take on versus the ninety percent you turn away? Who who's your ideal customer? Who are you looking for? Um, and how are you guys planning on getting in front of them today? This is kind of more of that like what's next segment for range. Yeah. So for us, what I'm typically looking for in, you know, in potential partners um, when they reach out is a couple of things for product, product and brand fit. Because we don't just work with direct consumer brands. About maybe 60% of our business is direct consumer. 40% is more like traditional retail. We work a lot of restaurant groups as well. Um, but ultimately, we're looking for a couple of things. One is they have to usually be doing at least like a two and a half to $3 million run rate if they're a direct consumer brand. Because before that, it's like taking bigger risks on creative puts a lot of pressure on yourself. And you don't really have enough learnings on what's working with your audience to like yeah. unleash a creative team on what you're doing. Um, you can take like, uh, you can, uh, you can be the one-eyed man amongst the blind, as you said earlier, but I'd rather be a two-eyed man amongst the uh, amongst the people that can actually see as well. So, um, so that's what we see in terms of like a, a starting point. But we, this year, we've worked with a lot of brands that are at 40, 50, 100 million, 500 million. And the, the other kind of client that we see is someone who's really looking to just be holistically supported in the velocity that they need to move. Like uh, we have clients where we do their, their, their videography, their photography, their copywriting, their email marketing, their website updates, um, you know, their, uh, their, their paid media, their organic social media, their influencer marketing, their PR. And so it's amazing to watch as that thing really takes off um, and has that velocity of all of the departments working together and in sync with one another. And that's where we see the, the biggest growth. But for us, it's like we can't really do that for less than like $20,000 a month. And only a certain type of client can afford that. Sure. And I, we totally understand that. Um, and there's a lot of people we talk to where it feels like talking to a avocado that's 
under ripened where it's like, Ooh, one day you're going to be great. But like, if we try to do this today, it's just going to lead to heartburn and it's too soon, you know, yeah. it's too soon to make that jump. Um, you know, Dr. Squatch being at that $3 million mark was a great starting place to build on their audience and to really, you know, if they had approached us in year one, we wouldn't have seen a success, right? It would have been yeah. too soon. We didn't, we wouldn't have learned enough. So now, how are you currently getting into those accounts? So you said you're bringing in a salesperson currently. Yeah. Um, that's probably very different than uh, not getting into because a lot of these are inbound. Um, if I do recall, I think we were introduced because you're thinking about also doing outbound and targeting specific accounts. Um, how, yeah. have you can, how have you thought about that specific approach getting in? Like, do you, do you try to get in with video because you can leverage like a Dr. Squatch type of campaign? and then expand from there? Or do you try to sell the whole house at one time? Like how have you guys strategically tried to get into these brands and maybe get one piece and then expand or, or whatever that might look like? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, well, it's a good question. Um, I would say that I kind of have two, two answers to that. One is in the past, we have found that selling the whole house is just overwhelming mm-hmm. for people. Um, it's not a it's not a really great place to start to build that trust, um, and so a lot of people start with us uh, usually with like one or two service lines, either top of funnel content, um, you know, photo video content. Um, uh, some of, some people have us do a brand refresh for them. You know, we have a really talented design team, um, really talented copywriters. Um, a lot of people are looking to us to help craft unique brand language for them. Um, because so many people, so many brands out there, even have grown to tens of millions, still have like the most vanilla like way of talking about themselves. And so it's usually something where there's like one or two um, product lines. We do a lot of websites first. So it's like a lot of people will find us from for websites, or they'll find us for video, or they'll find us for branding. And that's sort of like the three entry points. Um, in terms of the outbound stuff. Um, you know, that, that's part of what we're going to be learning. I just know that, um, you know, uh, I feel like we're, we're ready to, to try that and go after that. And, um, and just to be involved in some of those conversations, you know, um, we're not, uh, I have the belief that the mark, the, the U S marketing community is probably smaller than we realize, um, mm-hmm. in terms of like an insular world that, I've just because I started at 24, I just like never been a part of. I mean, even in San Diego, I'm just like now meeting some of my peers because I just I, I've just been focused on what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not a I'm not an antisocial person. I just haven't sought it out. Um, and I've had some really great connections with um, some local uh, agency owners, especially a, a, a couple of people over at Launch Boom. They do. Um, if you don't, if you haven't talked. If you haven't talked to them, you need to talk to them. Yeah, yeah it sounds like you. Ford, he, they're impressive, man. They're very impressive. Yeah. They are, and so um, just had a, a couple of good connections in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm. I, I feel like for us, if I look at the next ten years, I really want to take a swing at talking to the brands that we want to we want to talk to, um, and uh, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> cool. Um, well, let's finish this thing up, man. When we've we fought through Wi-Fi issues and connectivity and camera issues and audio, and and, and we're still here kicking. Uh, I had a camera die in the middle of the the broadcast, so we're we're working through it. We've had a good conversation. Um, I want to finish up with with one question about uh, Raindrop, and then I want to go into the round of random. Oh God. Um, so if you could look at Raindrop five years down the road, if you if you think that far. Um, I, sometimes it's hard for me to think that far from my business. Even if it's one year down the road, where do you see Raindrop going? Because you guys are already successful. You're doing great things. You work with awesome brands. It's obviously produce obvious that you produce results. Where do you see yourself being a couple of years down the road if you had it your way? If I had it my way, uh, that's a good question. I, I would say that it's a mix of two things. One is uh, it would be important to me that we would continue to grow so that those who want to continue their career trajectory with us have opportunities to do so. Um, And so I would, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we had somewhere between 80 to 100 people by then. That wouldn't shock me. Um, I think too, um, I I foresee us working uh, on 
some of our own brands um, and really um, and sort of piloting and working with like I, Adam and I are, are very we're very entrepreneurial. We love um, the fact that like we can create uh, something from nothing um, for our clients and for ourselves. Um, and uh, and so I could foresee certainly aspects of either. Um, I mean. If it, it might be a pipe dream, but I would love to also incubate, um, like you mentioned earlier, like brands who are at the two to three million dollar level. I'd love to have a venture capital type of like group that goes, you know what, like, um, you know, we are kind of like Sherpas. Like we've we've seen this path, we've seen the pain points. We have some amazing um, like consultant contacts that work more so like in the business, so that we don't have to work in the in the business. We can just focus on the marketing, but. Um, sometimes all my, I look at a brand and I'm like, all the numbers are there. All you need is money. Mm-hmm. And it'd be great to, to be able to have, have that. So we can talk about the next five years that that's what's been floating on my mind. Um, I don't know what that looks like yet, but, um, you know, I, I just think that we're, we're going to stay curious. We're going to stay nimble and just see, uh, where it all heads. I love it. I love your, I love your uh, emphasis on the people too. I think that's so important. Uh, the people that you that you guys have who entrust you as their employer, right? And, and I love I love our people. I mean, they're the, they're the best. They're like the kindest, smartest group of people I've ever met. So. It's evident in where you're investing. Well, Jacques, I want to jump into the last part, which is the round of random. Round of random is a few questions that myself and our audience want to know about you and our guests, um, and they're they're completely random. They could be business related, they could be personal related. I'm just going to fire them at you, and and whatever comes up comes up. Uh, so, Jacques, are you ready? Yeah, uh, Coke good. over Pepsi. <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. First question is: What is if you have one? What is your favorite piece of technology, or was a piece of technology you cannot live without? I mean, my my. Oh, actually, my Omigo bidet, and I'm not even joking. Uh-huh. If you do not own a bidet, <laughs> if you don't own a bidet attachment, it will fundamentally change the way that you poop, which will change your life every single day. Every time I use it, I'm just like, I wish the world knew about this. I'm glad that we work on that account because I am very passionate. That's about like that launch boom probably did on Kickstarter. <laughs> I'm, I'm, dude, I'm not. I'm not joking. I, I, I texted with a friend for 15 minutes yesterday, trying to convince him to buy one because he's like, I don't know. It sounds weird, and I'm like. It upsets me that you don't trust me enough to buy one. <laughs> I'm like, I'm telling you, this is a, the most important purchase I've made in the last two years. I He's love like, it. Oh. So anyway, that is a first by far. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I'm telling you, I got a promo code. Talk to me after Dude, the show. Shoot it over. I'll, I'll text you after this and we'll, we'll collaborate on bidets. I love it. <laughs> All right. Second question. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world who is either living or dead, who would you choose and why? Oh man! I mean, I know that I, I I would I wish I had a really deep answer, but the truth is, Will Smith. God, I love Will Smith. Okay. I mean, the man is forever relevant. He's so cool. Uh, I don't He's have many. It's been impressive. Uh, he is just he is he is our generation's uh, darling. I mean, the man is so talented. So he is. He can do it all. He can do it all. They can do it all. I just watched their uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air reunion or whatever they just had. Was, I haven't watched it yet. Was it good? It's a ten. Yeah, a little, it's a little emotional. Okay. It's a little emotional. Um, all right. Third question. Very easy question. Physical book or audio book? Physical. Oh, physical book versus audio book. Audio. Dude, I go fifty fifty these days. I know that's not a cool answer, but um, I, I go fifty fifty. I like to be able to highlight certain things in the book and some of the books. Um, but definitely stuff that's like for pleasure. I, I've, I've switched over to audio, but I would say I've gone more towards physical books for stuff that's like more business related. Stuff, yeah, just take notes and all that. Cool. Fourth one, if you could, and you kind of already alluded to this, if you could start any business, can't be an agency, um, what business would you start and why? And I guess the incubator could be part of that, but maybe if you have a direct consumer brand you wanted to build or a brand of your own. Yeah. You know, I think that. Um, what I have found um, is, yes, you, you want to be passionate about whatever it is that you're selling or doing. Mm-hmm. But um, the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter how passionate you are, if the, if the, like literally, if the cogs don't work, they don't work. And so I would say things that are over $50, consumable, 
um, that you can have high lifetime value that you can um, separate from that race to the bottom where like quality matters, brand matters. Uh, you know, it's like, it's math. Like I, I hate to put it that way, but um, I, I see people with amazing $30 products that they just can't scale because it's a one-time purchase and you have to get customer acquisition under 10 bucks. And it's like, well, that's hard. That's not fun. Like it's fun to see the world fall in love with your product or your brand. Yeah. That's just fun. So when you ask me what kind of brand would I start, I'm like, one that people could fall in love with and could like actually work. <laughs> yeah. One that you could actually create a Dr. Squatch type of video on, you know, yeah. a decent margin. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, most of us are, or most of us have something that we are irrationally passionate about. Obviously the, the bidet is part of that for you, but outside of that one, most of us have one or two things in our lives that we are irrationally passionate about. Some of it's sports, some people it's Star Wars, other people it's taking pictures of flowers on walks. What is it something that, you are irrationally passionate about outside of work. Oh man, irrationally passionate about. Well, that is a great question because I, I feel like all of my passions are rational, even if they're not. Um, I, I would say I'm a, a really big Aztec basketball fan. I find myself okay. like beating my chest like a gorilla in my own living room watching their games. And I'm like, I'm a grown man watching boys play a I'm sport, like, and, like freaking out. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, I definitely would put. I would put uh, bidets in that category. I mean, it's something that like literally if I have the opportunity to like make people uncomfortable and talk about it, God, it makes me so happy. And, and I'm bright. That's the thing. It's like, once they try it, they're like, Oh my gosh, like my whole life has been a lie up until this point. My level of intrigue is r rising by the minute. I'm telling you, man, like <laughs> it takes, it takes like four or five times to get used to. And then like now it's like you toilet paper is a lie. Like we, we are raised on a lie. Right. It, I feel barbaric when I, when I, when I don't, when I don't have it. And I've had employees tell me that when they go on trips, they'll be like, I miss my bidet. I'm like, I feel the same way. I hate pooping without it. You are an ambassador. I love it. <laughs> I, I believe, I believe in it. And you will too. Oh man, I'm pumped. Yeah. We'll have to link up and you know, I'll get a link from you. All right. Last question. Uh, where will people find you spending the most time online? How can people find out more about you and raindrop? Where do they go? We'll link up to this stuff. Yeah, I, I, I've been pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, I enjoy that community. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe I'm a workaholic. I don't know. I just, I just enjoy talking and, and reading about business. Um, that's the best place to probably link up with me and message me. I get back to people there. That's how, that's how we linked up. That's right. So, that's right. You know. well, and, well, I will link up to that in the show notes. Uh, Jacques, man, I, I'm humbled, grateful, thankful that you came. Uh, that you join us, that we fought through adversity together. I feel like we have a, a bond of fighting through technology today. And yeah, we do. Uh, maybe even a bond over bidets here shortly. Oh, man. I can't wait to hear your review, man. <laughs> well, thanks for joining me, dude. And um, we will talk here shortly. And if post production has a heyday with this one, and I have to buy you a bottle of bourbon or maybe a, an even fancier bidet to get you on again, we'll do that. But I think it'll turn out pretty awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you.